Hi everyone, hope you're well. So it's been a little while since I made a video. I was visiting my family for Easter uh, for a few days. There's a lot of things going on in the world right now. Um, a lot of things that uh, would be worth commentary. The deadly floods in South Africa. Um, the typhoon in the Philippines. Um, tropical storm actually, Meggie. Um, there was also, there have also, I should say, been violent protests in Sri Lanka and in Peru. Um, there's any number of things that I can talk about the French presidential race. Um, and actually I was going to make a video on how the internet has become the real battleground of ideology. Because recently there's been a lot of debate over how the internet is utilised. Um, of course I'm very interested in this because as a creator I'm, I'm part of it. You know, I'm, I'm putting out information and opinions out there and um, that's, uh, yeah, it's something that interests me. But rather than bringing it into this video, I might, uh, I might do that in another video. For this video specifically, I want to address um, something that is certainly related to that. Um, but it's on the issue of journalism and journalists who pretain to be independent. Um, I'll try and be specific about this one because there's a lot of overlap with other areas, but I'll try and be specific as much as possible. Um, so recently I've been seeing on Facebook advertisements, excuse me, advertisements for The Hill. Now this is a progressive publication. I'm just going to read out a bit from the Wikipedia article. If you're not familiar with this publication, it's just a bit of the background. Um, they have white lettering and a blue font background. Hill is an American newspaper and digital media company based in Washington, D.C. It was founded in 1994. In 2020, it was the largest independent political news site in the United States. Focusing on politics, policy, business and international relations, the Hill's coverage includes the U.S. Congress, the presidency and executive branch, and election campaigns. The Hill describes its output as nonpartisan reporting on the inner workings of government and the nexus of politics and business. The company's primary outlet is thehill.com. Hill is additionally distributed in print for free around Washington, D.C. and distributed to all congressional offices. It is owned by Nexstar Media Group. So uh, distributed in print around free, it must be, I, I don't know if it's quite a thin publication. Just a little bit of trivia, um, it was founded on my birthday, September 1st, 1994, which was my, um, that would have been my ninth birthday. Circulation 24,000 in print. Um, I, I have been familiar with The Hill before. I didn't ever have any strong views on it because um, I was familiar with it, but I didn't, I didn't read it. I didn't really have any strong views on it. Um, and I still don't about the publication itself. Um, but there's one particular reporter that they have on The Hill, and she uh, is becoming quite a controversial figure. Of course, for pundits, being controversial is quite lucrative. Uh, we know in Britain from Piers Morgan, the more controversial you are, the more your name rises. And the thing about journalism and uh, this whole industry in general is there is a lot of ego involved. There's no getting away from it. And, you know, I'm not going to lie. I want my name to be out there. I want to make my name in the business. I'm not going to lie about that. So there is absolutely a degree of ego involved. Um, and I find that people who are controversial and contrarian are more likely to get noticed. It's lucrative. And that's a little bit cynical. It's not, you know, uh, a good journalist should be known for being a good journalist, not for just being controversial. Um, but sticking to Kim Iverson, um, I don't know a great deal about her background, but some of her positions recently... I think warrant a bit of scrutiny. Uh, now on her Facebook page, she has, I believe it's 29,000 followers. So she's fairly influential. Um, probably not a household name. Um, just as a comparison, Jake Taper on CNN has over 200,000. This is a sort of comparison. But uh, I am troubled uh, by some of the positions that she's taken. Troubled, um, frankly, quite angry, and I'll explain why. Um, and I think she's not the only one. So, uh, she has not been shy of her political views, and that would be fine if she was actually in the capacity of a pundit. 
Now, the big problem I have with Kim Iverson, and she's not the first person to do this, is she constantly makes this point about being an independent journalist, right? And she makes a big thing about uh, being a voice against the mainstream media. Well, I've heard that many times. It's kind of become the um, the vogue of people who want to say, oh, I'm different. I'm different. I'm not the mainstream media. And if you look at her videos, and indeed her Facebook pages, you would somewhat expect um it's you know it's full of supporters that is and they're just absolutely um full of praise and i suppose that's not uh perhaps we shouldn't read too much into that any public figure is going to have supporters so perhaps we shouldn't read too much into that but uh there's a few things that caught my attention now she's been accused of being pro-russia so i thought um what's the basis for this is there anything in that um a while back uh i forget who it was i think it was a politician and she said that she should um work for rt and she said um what's wrong with rt this was in a tweet apparently what's wrong with rt now to me that the fact that she even asked that maybe she was being sarcastic but the fact she even asked that makes me question her moral compass now, uh, she made a video a while back, uh, which certainly catches one's attention. Uh, Butcher was the British. This is referring to the Butcher massacre in Ukraine, which about 300 uh, civilians died, were slaughtered. Um, now, before we get into that, um, the thing about Ukraine is... Well, let's just start with the basic fact that no one can deny, no one, um, Russia invaded Ukraine. That's just it's not even a case of oh, it's a verifiable fact. It, it was such a big thing. It's not something that can be rationally disputed. Russia invaded Ukraine. Russia's in Ukraine. It's, it's not like, well, maybe they did it. Although there are some people insane enough to believe that um, the whole thing is CGI. I've heard that. I mean, it's, it's madness, but there are people who believe that. Um, you know, <laughs> as if as if Ukrainian refugees don't exist. These people who have actually fled the war zone and have been through it. But anyway, um, so she had this report uh, talking about Russian claims on Butcher, and she said that um, yeah, incidentally, you know, Russia said they weren't going to invade, and that's exactly what they done. So the Kremlin has been shown to be liars. I mean, it's just their lies were plain to see to the world. They say we're not going to invade. Lavrov still calls it a special military operation. We're not going to invade, and that's exactly what they've done. Right, that's a fact. Okay, and no one can say that that hasn't happened. Now, uh, Kim Iverson uh, had this report when she was talking about. Lukashenko, the dictator in Belarus, pro Moscow, of course, um, he claimed that Butcher was the British. But the way she presented this um, was very dubious. You know, she had the little um, headlines and it was Butcher was a British tip. Check out the report. Reluctant to share it because I, uh, I don't like to promote this sort of thing, but um, I'll put it for convenience sake. Um, Butcher was the British. Now the thing is, at uh, first glance you might think, okay, well she's just, don't shoot the messenger, she's just quoting what Lukashenko said. But I've seen enough of her posts um, to have a fairly good idea of where her politics lies. And the thing I find reprehensible about people like Kim Iverson is her false claim to not have a political agenda. Now she says she's just a journalist, she's just doing her job, but if you look at her page, there are a lot of posts there that show she is very political. Very. And there's nothing wrong with having political opinions. But she's not honest about it. She says it's all in the guise of her journalistic research. Um, now, if she was truly an independent journalist, what she would be doing is scrutinising Russia's claims. For example, um, and their allies' claims, when Lukashenko claimed that Butcher was the British... She just reports it, but there's no follow-up. 
There's no uh, I cannot independently verify this or um, Lukashenko can't prove these claims. He just reports it like it's it's a fact. And the big giveaway with this woman is whenever she talks about NATO in the West, it's critical, it's negative. How she can say with a straight face that she isn't political as she did in one of her posts, someone had else had challenged her, is that she's not politicised, is is just dishonest. Kim Iverson and the online event that you're watching this, you're very political. Don't think that you can fool um, loads of us who are reading between the lines. You're very political. And I get that your fans won't see that. Because, you know, uh, it's an echo chamber and they agree with everything you say. So, of course, they're not going to say you're political. They're going to say you're a wonderful journalist. Oh, you ask the questions mainstream media doesn't. You also promote Russian propaganda that mainstream media doesn't. But importantly, you promote it without challenging it. A truly independent journalist, fine, quote what Lukashenko said, quote what Putin said, but challenge it. Or at least say there's no way to prove this. The fact that you failed to do that in the report, to me, says a lot. Um, she also had a video on Tulsi Gabbard, who I've also uh, spoken about. Congresswoman Gabbard, who infamously visited Assad a few years ago. Now, when I made a video about Gabbard, I got a lot of heat from her supporters. Um, but here's the interesting thing, you know, in the case of Tulsi Gabbard, she was criticised for visiting Assad. Um, not surprisingly, Kim Iverson had a video defending her. I mean, they think alike. They both have a soft spot for dictators. So I'm not at all surprised that Kim Iverson would defend her position. But just to touch on Tulsi Gabbard, incidentally, she's been coming out with some very questionable positions recently in terms of uh, uh, the West's role. Um, the big narrative that Gabbard always comes out with is any Western politician, uh, and she particularly attacks her own party, who takes a tough line with dictators, is a warmonger and we can't trust them. Um, now, I know that she's been in the armed forces, so some of this may be coming from her experience. I'm not sure if she's done a tour of duty or not. I know that she's been in the, I don't know if it was the army or the marines, but I know that she's got experience. Another thing with Tulsi Gabbard is she's not shy to use that. And it's a little bit manipulative because it's sort of like, well, you can't criticise me because I serve my country. Um, but regardless of her military service, I judge politicians on their politics. Tulsi Gabbard's a politician. She's an elected politician. It's therefore valid to scrutinise her positions. And her worldview is pretty much if you condemn a dictator, then you're a warmonger. I think that's a very dangerous overview. Um, and she talks about, you know, the um, and so does Kim Iverson. Well, look at the weapons of mass destruction that didn't exist. And actually, this is one reason I personally feel Iraq was such a disaster. Um, Firstly, there was the humanitarian side. It was it greatly destabilized the country. Um, the the evidence that was supposedly based on wasn't there. It was a disaster, an absolute disaster, and will always by the legacy of George W. Bush and Tony Blair and the other leaders who went in. Um, I don't believe that the removal of Saddam was in itself a bad thing. Unlike George Galloway, I think um, Saddam was a monstrous dictator. But the Iraq war was, was a disaster. So I, I just mentioned that because I think the danger is that is always, always used by people who have a soft spot for dictators to say, well, if this dictator is condemned, then it's going to be another Iraq, right? And there's a lot of distortion going on in the case of Syria. It's not comparable to Iraq. The Iraq war started because Britain and America invaded Iraq. The Syria war started because Assad um, unleashed brutal force on legitimate protests. Great irony is people like Tulsi Gabbard and Kim Iverson would be all for uh, protesting against mask mandates and so on. But when it comes to dictator crushing legitimate protests, they were told in the dictator's narrative that he's a stabilizing force. This is what I find so odious and reprehensible about this sort of worldview. And I'm not saying they're the only ones, but you have two people there, one a so-called journalist, one 
uh, congresswoman. Um, so they have influence in different spheres. Gabbard's never going to be president. She has influence. Um, and I really, really strongly resent what she does. She sort of presents, I'm talking about Tulsi Gabbard here. She presents herself as a passive, as like this cautious, you know, person who wants to avoid war. That would be very admirable. But that doesn't mean you have to pander to the lies of dictators. I mean, the whole argument for her going to Assad was for diplomatic reasons. But she wasn't the Secretary of State. As far as I know, she wasn't a member of the State Department. She had no business going. Um, she is the equivalent of what we would call in the UK a backbench MP. She had no business going to Syria. And if it really was for diplomatic reasons, it followed that if she's meeting Assad, she'll meet the opposition. Now, as far as I know, she never did. If I'm wrong about that, someone can correct me. But it follows that if you're going for diplomatic reasons, you'll meet both sides. Now, Tulsi Gabbard subsequently condemned Assad, called him a dictator. But only after all the criticism, she couldn't bring herself to do that on her own ground. She's only done it to deflect the criticism. Um, now she's attacking the Biden administration for its tough line on Russia. So what would she have Biden do? Do nothing? Um, Kim Iverson's the same. You know, um, because NATO's taken a tough line, NATO uh, um, is massing troops on the Polish border. Well, is it any bloody wonder? I mean, Finland and Sweden are being pushed towards NATO. But in the mind of someone like Kim Iverson, oh, well, that's proof of NATO's belligerence. They're being pushed towards NATO because of Russia's aggression. What I find most reprehensible about people like Kim Iverson, and she's not the only one, in the Syria war there was Eva Bartlett, who's kind of went off the radar now, there's been others, um, and they make this big thing about being independent journalists. Well, I've trained as a freelance journalist. Now, if I am reporting a war situation, I might want to hear both sides. What I'm not going to do is promote the narrative of a dictatorship or an invading force without scrutinising it. The first job of any journalist is to tell the truth, or at least get the information that they can, that's available, to do the research they can do in order to tell the truth. And if all the research isn't available, if all the information isn't available, then state the fact. Say, you know, we were blocked from getting this information or whatever it is. There are real bar barriers to journalists, but I, I find it utterly reprehensible for any journalist say that they are free thinking when they are so blatantly pushing a political agenda. Now, I'm a, I'm a very opinionated person. I've got views on things. As a journalist, if I'm doing an opinion piece, if I'm being a pundit, I'm going to be upfront. I'm going to say, this is my opinion. And I would have to use facts for situations where I'm citing that and so on. I would have to state facts. But I would make it clear that it's my opinion. It's not a report. Now, what Kim Iverson does, from what I've seen, is, is she's presenting this stuff as reports, but she's a pundit. She's political. And I wrote this on her Facebook page, whether she replies or not, because I think people like this need to be challenged. It's dangerous because, you know, she had this thing, uh, Butcher Wars, the British, and then there was a tick beside it. Now, it didn't say Lukashenko claims Butcher was the British. It was Butcher was the British and a tick beside it. So that's spreading misinformation. Someone taking a quick look at that would think, well, this must be, you know, this must be the fact. My gut feeling is that Kim Iverson is um, definitely not as independent as she claims. My gut feeling is she has sympathies to Moscow. I think Tulsi Gabbard does. I don't trust either of them. And I think that their supporters tend to be very aggressive and very um, forceful in saying that, uh, you know, anyone who thinks differently is a warmonger or um, whatever it is. You know, whatever way they want to denigrate that position, vindicate themselves. But there's absolutely nothing brave. I mean, there's this notion that there's something brave about pandering to tyranny. Um, 
because oh they stand up to the mainstream media it's just uh it's just dishonest it's just um i think it's moral cowardice especially when they're you know sitting in the comforts of some office in washington dc they're not someone who's seen their family slaughtered by a russian airstrike kind of makes me sick actually and i'm aware that the influence is limited i'm not suggesting they have enormous support but it's enough 29,000 likes on Kim Iverson's page. Tulsi Gabbard supporters are very vocal. Even though they present her as this reasonable centrist sort of person, I don't think she is. I think Tulsi Gabbard has a long track record of um, pandering to dictators. That's bad in Syria, more recently Putin. And she's not stupid. I don't think she's stupid. I mean, she's not going to come out and say, I support Putin, or come out and say Russia's right and we're wrong. No, it's more subtle than that. But anyone with half a brain can see what they're doing if you just read between the lines, if you just look at the angle that they take. I think it's utterly reprehensible. So what they'll do is they'll present any sort of uh, sanctions or tough talk as, as warmongering. When what it really is, is the right thing, standing up to tyranny. Um, there's others I, I haven't named here George Galloway, the odious George Galloway just in case anyone thinks I'm being sexist by just talking about women but I already made a video with Galloway I, I mean it, it depresses me and it angers me because I think that these people are quite clever I think they're manipulative, I think they're clever I think they know what they're doing and I think their their claims are just false the claims to be um, just a voice of independence. Well, you might be thinking outside the box in the sense that you're not um, agreeing with with, uh, <laughs> with the evidence or the facts, but being contrarian for the sake of it is not brave unless it's, you know, you're taking very real risks. What is brave? What is brave is Russian dissidents who are risking long prison sentences and violence to speak out against Putin. I have nothing but respect for them. What is brave is frontline journalists and war zones who try their best to get to the truth. Um, what is not brave is journalists who claim to be independent, but they serve as propaganda for a regime. And, you know, they technically might not be employed by any particular agency. Technically, they may be freelancers. But if you find yourself in a position where you are just regurgitating exactly what the regime is saying without challenging it. I saw one video, and I'll close with this. A guy who was captured in Ukraine, um, Aidan Aslim, and there was uh, an older man as well. Um, it was very disturbing to watch. There was a British guy interviewing him. Now, he wasn't being roughed up or anything. In fact, the the British guy was very careful to say, oh, we'll give you water and look, we're treating you in a civil way. Of course, he denounced everything. He said, I chose the wrong side, uh, etc., etc., etc. But he's in a captivity. Goodness knows what the Russians were forcing him to say. As for the British journalists working for the Russians, um, disgust doesn't sum it up. It really doesn't sum it up. I remember... When British journalists were working for RT, um, and Americans as well, a lot of them resigned at the time of the invasion. And, you know, they'd done the right thing, but was that self-preservation or was it because they finally found a conscience? I'm afraid I'm quite cynical, because there was many, many opportunities to resign before. Why did they wait so long? Why did it take the invasion of a country for them to see what RT was? Now, I think if they're sincere, if they're against the invasion, they should publicly denounce it and publicly denounce Russia today. Otherwise, I think they're just trying to save their own hides from infamy, from being stooges for uh, for this regime. But that's how I feel. Um, if you are a Kim Iverson or Tulsi Gabbard fan, bring it on. You know, I'll leave the comments section open. You can ask me what you want. I'm prepared to defend my position. So throw it out there. And um, if you support me and if you like this content, please do feel free to share and subscribe.
everything I've said, you know, you can find this in her page. Um, and as for the basic facts of the matter, fact one, Russia invaded Ukraine. Fact two, or maybe this should be fact one, Russia said it wasn't going to invade Ukraine. Well, that's a proven lie. No one can deny it. It's just... It's just what happened. That is history. That is fact. And even now, see Russia's apologists going out of their way to do what they're doing. I mean, it angers me. I can only imagine what that would do to someone who had to bury their entire family under rubble in Mariupol or Butcher. I mean, I can't imagine the mental health side effect of that the mental anguish probably at that point they wouldn't even be thinking about the media side of it they'd just be focusing on on the raw raw grief and i can't imagine it i think it must be the biggest nightmare imaginable though um so you know i i hope they're not exposed to this stuff because they're dealing with it enough as it is so if they see russia's lies being promoted in the west i just think that would be um unbearable but what the world has seen and I will close with this is the resilience and the courage of the Ukrainian people against a much more powerful enemy and that's admirable and that's inspiring a hell of a lot more inspiring than these um, these shameless propagandists Another one, I don't think I mentioned this in a will, I will, will close with this because it's directly related, a uh, Ukraine crisis. Page on Facebook calling themselves Ukraine crisis. Uh, they actually posted a video of that guy being interviewed, interrogated, used as a propaganda tool. Um, and almost every review says the same thing. So at least people are seeing through it for what it is, pro-Russian propaganda. And they, they try to have a neutral name, but it's plain to see what they are. Uh, okay. Thanks for watching, and I will, um, yeah, feel free to share and subscribe.